Matthew 13, starting at verse 44, and it reads, The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure that a man discovered hidden in a field. In his excitement, he hid it again and sold everything he owned to get enough money to buy the field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant on the lookout for choice pearls. When he discovered a pearl of great value, he sold everything he owned and bought it. If you will, as you're preparing to take your seats, help me introduce the title for today's message. Everyone say, what's it worth to you? Amen. You may take your seats. What's it worth to you? When I was a kid, um, one of the stories that will always stick in my mind blazing is me begging my parents for a BMX bike. I've told this story, but I think it is worth repeating. I was one of those kids that thought I was going to be a famous bicyclist. Not because I was going to be racing and everything. No, I was going to be one of those guys that did all the tricks, willies and grinds and flips. That was going to be me. And if you were able to become that person, you needed not just any old type of bike. Schwinn was good, but it wasn't able to do what I needed for it to do. I needed all the pegs that would allow you to grind or, or to put your feet on or, or, you know, do all the tricks, stand up while you got your hands off. You know, I wanted to be that guy. And so I had petitioned my parents, like all good children do, for a BMX bike. I gave all the reasons why this was the bike to get. And in my humility, I said, now, of course, I'll take whatever bike you get me. <laughs> However, if it is at all possible that it could be a BMX bike, oh, how amazingly excited I would be. I did great in school, got amazing grades, and my parents, like absolutely wonderful parents, did everything they could. And I believe, I actually believe, they gave me a bike for Christmas. Now, this is funny because we live in Chicago. And so for those of y'all that live here, getting a bike for Christmas don't sound weird. That's normal because y'all can go outside year round and use everything all the time. Chicago. <laughs> It's not so much. If you get a bike for Christmas, that means you can't use it for like five months. Like it just sits there because I can't do nothing with it. But I asked for it. They gave it to me. I'm excited. This bike is there. I mean, it was jet black. It was perfect with red stripes. I'm telling you, I was the I waited all spring. I wanted to go. I wanted to ride it in the snow. Finally, I get the chance, the summer comes, it's time for me to be able to ride this bike. It is absolutely wonderful. I'm super excited and my parents give me the talk. Now listen here, son, this is your bike. Don't let nobody ride this bike. Come on, keep looking at me. I know some of y'all, y'all remember the toys that your parents gave you and couldn't nobody else play with. This is your bike. Now don't let nobody else ride this bike. You ain't got to work. Who am I? Let somebody ride this bike. This is my bike. I'm on this bike all day, every day, Ricky Bobby. Like, that was my life. I'm riding a bike. I'm having an absolutely amazing time. I'm showing off. And all of a sudden, a kid I had never met shows up on the block. He asked to ride my bike. <laughs> no, dude, because can't nobody ride this bike but me. He keeps on playing. We having a great time. We just become like fast friends. And he asked again, can I ride your bike? No, man, I told you, can't nobody ride my bike. Now, all day he has been playing with this golf ball. This is a setup. <laughs> I mean, I've never seen anybody have as much fun as he had with this golf ball. It wasn't a new golf ball. He wasn't playing golf. He was playing 
in the inner city with the golf ball. When I tell you this man had the most fun with this golf ball, I'm like, wow. That's a f he tossed it over to me. Hey, man, you want to see it? Man, this is cool. Tossed it back to him. Can I ride your bike? Man, I have told you now, you can't ride this bike. Go throughout the day. He says, listen, man, I promise I'm not going to steal your bike. In fact, you can hold my golf ball. <laughs> now, keep looking at me now. Because he had had an amazing time with this golf ball. It was no way in the world he was going to leave me with this golf ball and take my bike. All right, man, this is it. I'll let you ride, but you can only go two cars down. Don't you go no further. Two cars. Man, don't worry. I got you. Hold the golf ball. I grab the golf ball. He jumps on a bike. He gets the car one, and I'm like, all right. Don't forget, car two. He gets the car two. All right, turn around. He gets the car three. Hey, you, you're supposed to turn at car two. Then he turns down the alley. Now I'm running with a golf ball in my hand and this boy on my bike. I wasn't that fast um, to catch up with this kid on my bike. And before I was able to get to the alley, he had cut another corner and he was gone. Never saw that bike again a day in my life. I sat on the porch, still with the golf ball in my hand, <laughs> trying to figure out if I should just run away now. Like, <laughs> it never crossed my mind that I should go back into the house and tell my parents that I just got got. It was like, OK, either I have to die or I have to run away. These are my only choices. And great parents always check up on their kids. Mother comes to the door, son, what you doing sitting here on the porch? <laughs> See, my way, get it, go for <laughs> I go to tell her the story. She shakes her head, jumps in the car, sees the weekend, did it, calls my father. I'm utterly embarrassed because now I have to tell my parents that I gave the bike that I begged for, the bike that was worth the world, the bike that was worth me putting all of this work in for the grades and everything, I gave it away for a golf ball. <laughs> What's it worth to you? Now, of course, you know, this is a funny and sad story, right? My parents loved me enough that they did give me another bike. They didn't give me a BMX, though. They were like, you've missed your BMX window, OK? <laughs> You're going with Huffy from now on, all right? That's <laughs> you at the Huffy level of life. <laughs> However, that sat with me, still sits with me to this day, because I recognize that in that moment, I did what I hope I would never, ever do again in life. That in not recognizing the value of something, for a brief moment, I, will allow, I allowed somebody to give me something of far lesser value. And I held on to it. So here it is. Jesus now is telling a story. He's telling a parable, and remember, parables are not just analogies. Remember, these are the stories that Jesus tells to both reveal and conceal. That he allows information to be known while also shrouding information that can only be revealed to us by the Spirit of God. He tells of two different people. He said one is a person who is working. And along their work, they find in a field an amazing treasure. And recognizing its amazing value, watch this, they bury it back, sell everything they have, and go and buy the field. Now, I'll put a push pin here because I want to make sure that we're getting, did he say that? Because any of us 
would have to recognize that this would be sketchy moral and ethical boundaries at best. If someone came to my house and found something in my house that was amazingly valuable, then hid it up again and gave me a price for it that did not involve me knowing of the amazingly valuable thing that's there so that they could get access to it, that is ethically questionable at best, morally incomprehensible at worst. Yet Jesus lifts this up as a story about the kingdom. Then he goes and he lifts up another story similar. He says, there's a merchant out there in search for amazing pearls. He's looking for these that are of great value. One can tell from his ideal, the way that he phrases it, that this is what this person does. They go through to try to find all of these good things. And he says, now he's found one. And it is so amazing that he, like this other worker, sells everything he has to go back and buy the pearl. Now, I'm often amazed that even in Jesus' teaching about the kingdom, that he doesn't have to make it look perfect or beautiful to try to describe his point. He doesn't worry if the story is a little dirty or if the story is a little edgy or if there's some other questionable things that are about the story because the story is not meant to get deep into the analogy about all of these things. We have to watch when we preach these messages or when we think about these messages and we look at them in ways other than what they're meant to be used. Jesus is not worried about how morally comprehensible or ethical this other guy is. He's not worried about what has caused this person to go and search for great jewels. What he is is concerned about is their response to finding it. It doesn't matter where they came from. It doesn't matter how moral they start off. It doesn't matter how good they are that the kingdom, when it is found by somebody, when either they find it by accident or they've been searching for, when you get access to the kingdom. It changes something about the way that you go around. When you, you really touch the kingdom, when, when you experience the kingdom of God, it is absolutely worth more, infinitely more than anything you could have ever had before. Jesus is saying, this is likened to the kingdom. And so, before I jump deeply into just what they did, it might be healthy for us to understand the kingdom. Everybody say the kingdom. It is almost impossible to rightly read the gospel of Matthew and not have an understanding of the kingdom. The kingdom, as, as Matthew writes it, in fact, they show up as kingdom of heaven or kingdom of God. Both of these terms are used interchangeably. They're not different. They are the same to Matthew. Matthew is writing about this kingdom and this idea, this concept of kingdom. It is foundational to how he understands not only the gospel, but the world, the kingdom. And he is writing that pulls on Old Testament scripture, Old Testament thought, but also in ways that are now adopted and adapted to where he is experiencing now. Matthew is writing and he's writing with the notion that there is but one God, creator of all things. And in the midst of this one God with all creative power, creation is no longer fully aligned with creator. This idea of kingdom builds upon the notion that now creation is in rebellion with the very one who created it. Thus, it's not just the kingdom of God or of heaven, but there are other kingdoms. 
and these kingdoms come in direct opposition with the very kingdom of God and of heaven. Their ways are different. Their ideologies are different. They fight at heart with what it is that creator, lover, wonderful God would have for us to do. We cannot understand this parable until we understand that what he is saying is that there is a space by which God is in full leadership. Yet that is not always evidenced in our everyday lives. <laughs> that, and that for, for Matthew, this notion of kingdom, it is not a location. I want you to hear that. We, we, think of, like, we think about nations or countries, right? There are boundaries. You go to this place and it is there. This is not what, what, what Matthew is talking about. He's talking about the very rule of God, that when he's calling God king, this is building off of God's sovereignty. God alone created everything. And not only has God created everything, although there are other kingdoms, there is no peer to God. I want you to hear this because this, this will help us build out what we're trying to understand. God has no equal. As much as the world rebels against God, as much as they fight at the idea of what God would desire, can I tell you that the enemy, the devil, is not a peer to God? It is not as if they are equal and uh, opposite powers. I know we hear this often, right? It is the yin and the yang. It is good versus evil. And these two things pull in tension to make sure everything stays centered. No, there is one God. One God above all who has no equal. The devil has no power against the God that we serve. And so when Matthew writes about the kingdom, he says, I'm recognizing that we live in an experience that we don't have to. Because we have given leadership to that which is actually subservient. Thus, the kingdom of heaven has to be taught because you don't rightly or normally see it. It is this notion, this idea that the kingdom of heaven is so vastly different that leads us into experiences and ideologies that often sound crazy. Now, uh, I'll take the liberty. Push pin. I'm always going back and forth on what should, how deep should I get into this, right? The notion of the kingdom of God creates the opportunity for us to believe things that could lead us the wrong way. I've watched the idea of Christendom, the church, and how we respond to worldly situations. And there are moments where in our trying to decipher the kingdom that we really do sound crazy. Sometimes for good reason and sometimes because we're completely off. So I say that in holding, right? Like we're, we're coming out of the pandemic. Literally, I was just in the airport and apparently I hadn't got the memo that the pandemic was over. Because everybody else knew. Like they're walking through this airport with like a gajillion people and I saw three masks. Two of them were with me and then it was one other person, <laughs> right? But early on, right, there was this conversation like, is it, is it kingdom minded to put on a mask? Is it kingdom minded to get a vaccine? Could that be anti-kingdom? In fact, people stood up and said, it is my God who protects me. My God shall supply all of my needs. My God is a healer. He is, uh, but I imagine that you still take uh, cold medication. Um, I also imagine if you were in a car accident, you wouldn't be like, uh-uh, don't put me in that ambulance. My God is about to heal my body. Right? So we struggle, right? But but I recognize that this notion of what kingdom we access and how God will have leadership and reign in our lives can make us sound crazy. 
And Matthew is writing and saying there's no other way to rightly understand the work of Jesus than without understanding that God has a kingdom. This is why earlier in Matthew 6, as he, he's talking about, we call it the Lord's Prayer, but it's really as he's teaching the disciples to pray, he says, thy kingdom come. Although God's kingdom has always been, it is still yet emerging in our personal experience. God, your kingdom come. We don't always live as if you are leading us. And so there has to be a way that we appropriate your kingdom coming. And we recognize that there is a day where your fullness of the kingdom will be manifest in the world. And there will not be another power available that you will judge all things. And when that day comes, we want to be on the right side. That us sitting here, he says, Jesus begins to teach. He says, can I teach you a little bit about the kingdom? Because the kingdom is a little different than what you experience day to day. The kingdom may not may not line up with what you thought it was. But the kingdom here is something amazingly different that Matthew is writing. This is God's rule. This is God's way. This is how God will enact his purposes in the world. And that the kingdom is not just the way in which his elected people exist. Thus, there is a difference between kingdom and what we would now call the church. That the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God is not synonymous with the church of God. The same way that the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven is not synonymous with the children of Israel. Follow me. Literally, God picks a people by which to enact his will and purposes in the earth. It is through the Israelite people that God brings the Messiah into the world. And yet they are the first people to fight when the Messiah comes. Therefore, there are moments where we can be participating in the kingdom and fighting the kingdom sometimes at the same time. I say that to a group of people who have been critical of the church and sometimes rightfully so. That even as I lead a local church, I don't have to fight the idea that the church has not always lived up to what we thought it would be because we have walked in with the expectations that the church would be the full embodiment of the kingdom. And when we meet the church and find out that it's really not all that the kingdom ought to be, we get ourselves frustrated because shouldn't it look like what I thought I saw or what I thought he said or how they used to act or what they did back then and I'm not saying Seeing that right now, and you are right. It's no turning back from that. I don't have to run away from it. It's the honesty. It's the reason why I don't watch movies like Hunt for Jesus. Because I know I'm gonna get offended. Like, okay, just I'm, I'm, this is gonna be a Jason moment, and I promise I'm gonna move on. <laughs> I take it so personal when people talk about the church. Like, it's like they talked about my mama. It's like my mama then the church. Like, that's how how I really take it. And the reason I take it like that is because we talk about things like anything is perfectly good. When the gift that God is actually showing us is that he doesn't need perfectly good things to bring about his perfection. Hear it again. The gift of the kingdom, as we'll see even in this parable, is that God didn't need perfect things to get to the perfect end, but God used the imperfect to get there. And I wish I had people that would have shouted right there. See, we didn't shout right there because we sit in the position of looking from our own perfection at things that are imperfect. But if we really would have heard what I got said, we recognize that that means that even in my imperfection, I got a God that's still able to use me because I'm not good. I'm messed up. I have made mistakes, but I serve a God that still is able to use me despite my imperfection. Perfections. The kingdom of God is like using imperfect people to do perfect things. It is amazing 
how God does this work. He says, I want you to get it. Because it's not fully lived into yet, but it's coming. The church that you desire is not fully here yet, but it's coming. The life that you desire is not fully here yet, but it's coming. All those things that you know are wrong, that sit in your soul, that you say, this just ain't right. God says that too, but it's coming. And last thing, and then I'll talk about why this thing is so good then. This also means then that the kingdom of heaven and of God are not moved, shifted, or changed by human hands. We get into bad exegetical space when we start saying things like, it is our hands that build the kingdom. God never said that. He says, this is my kingdom. I'm building it. It will show up when I have it show up. The gift that you can be is you can participate with it or you can jump out of it, but you don't get a chance to build it. And since you can't build it, you can't tear it down. Since you didn't build it, you can't mess it up. Since you didn't build it, you can't put your name on it. Since you didn't build it, it can't give you glory. Since you didn't build it, it has nothing to do with you. And I say that on a church's anniversary because we might get confused and start thinking that the reason we've been here 57 years is because of us. It's because of our gifts. It's, it's because of our doing. It's because of what we did. But can I tell you, had it not been for the Lord that was on, I wish I had some people that could acknowledge that it's Nothing but the divine hand of God. He says the kingdom. He says you got to get this about the kingdom because then that changes how you go after things. It changes how you live. It changes your expectations. Once I know now that the kingdom is here yet still not yet. It's available, but still developing. When I recognize it's not my hands that do it, thus it's not my hands that can undo it. When I recognize that it really ain't about us, but it's truly about God, this puts me in the position to see what God is doing. Thus, God has had to work through the church and in the church, but God has also had to work outside of the church and without the church. What are you saying, Pastor? Therefore, the kingdom of God can happen in places where the church is absent. Hear it. Therefore, the kingdom of God can happen in places where the church is absent. And that doesn't mean that the church is wrong or that doesn't mean that the church is unnecessary. It means that we are talking about God and God is too big for any conception that we can have. Therefore, we let God be God. And we do our best to participate. There are liberation movements that God is active in, but that don't mean that that's God's whole thing. That doesn't mean that the God is not still working within his body. That is the church, even though we are imperfect. I am blown away by the kingdom. Thus, when these individuals, one by happenstance, bumps into the kingdom, and one by searching finds the kingdom, both of them have the same response. There's nothing I currently own. No way I have currently existed. No thing I can point to right now that is worth more than what the kingdom can provide for me. It is the kingdom that I've been searching for all my life. It is the kingdom that has the power of God available. 
It is the kingdom where God is at work. It is the kingdom where God reigns. It is the kingdom where God is. It is the kingdom where God transforms. It is the kingdom that we all, we all should be striving for. The kingdom that can pull us forward. That make us, help us make sense of a crazy world. Of a crazy church. Of crazy individuals. It is nothing but the transformative work of God that can turn people around the way only God can do. So, in 57 years, our church has seen a lot of kingdom things happen. We've seen things that go completely inexplicable for how they worked for us and how we came together. We've seen God move in amazing ways and We've seen things that have been nothing like the kingdom. We've had moments where we've stepped outside of the boundary, maybe even trying to go after God. And we've missed it. And if I can be honest, we're going to miss it again. As long as you and I are here and we're imperfect, there'll be moments where we might step outside the boundaries of God. But if we can be a people constantly searching and seeking for God, if we can be a people that constantly say it is worth more than everything I have, I guarantee even though we may step out, God can pull us right back in. Even though we mess up, God can still bless us despite. Even though we ain't got it all worked out, God can still fill in the gaps. I wish I had a church that was excited about the kingdom of God. About the kingdom of God working for us and recognizing that each of us are still trying to be like the merchant and the worker. Now, I'll be honest. <clears throat> When I think about my own life, I can recognize there's still things that I'm not willing, have not been willing to sacrifice for the benefit of the kingdom. I want you to look at me. Some of us, you know, we can talk about it, right? And, you know, our resources are easy, right? That's the easy analogy. We can ask the questions like, what are you willing to give for God resource-wise? Right? And some of us, we struggle with what that looks like. Well, do I give it to the church? Or what if I just give it to poor people? Or what if I just save it? Because you never know when God may want me to use it at a later on time that may also be for me. <laughs> right? Because if we're honest, that thing is still more important. Yeah. Some of us, it may not just be the resource. It may be our own desire for success. When you were a kid, you defined it a very certain way. You lived a certain way, and you said never again, but you have to go without. Yeah. Therefore, everything that you put together in your life right now is so that you will never be back there. And back there and who you will be is now the thing that has become even more important than God to you. Some of you, it is the job. Some of you, it is the person that you are in relationship with. Whatever it is, if we can't get to the position that the kingdom is like someone that found it and was willing to give everything for it, then we too are those that step outside the kingdom and try to operate in our own hand. And I say that recognizing how challenging that is for me. But if God is to do anything amazing and special, it happens in the transformation of what we used to be to who we're becoming. And I believe God is calling us to become something far greater and better. Jesus says the kingdom is like this. That once they found it, they gave everything up for it. So I ask now, what is the kingdom worth to you? Pray with me.